This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. Today, we're going to be talking about Calvin Coolidge, who was the 30th president of the United States, and all things Coolidge with Rashad Thomas uh, from the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Welcome, Rashad. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, we're going to really be uh, talking a great deal about what the foundation is, where it is, what it does. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Certainly. Well, um, my name is Rashad Thomas, as we mentioned, and I'm a, a native of central Florida. So um, all this cold weather in Vermont is very new to me. <laughs> but um, I'm here for my love of President Coolidge. I um, I have a bachelor's degree from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University in Tallahassee, Florida, and a master's degree in government from Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I met our chairman at the Coolidge Foundation, Amity Schlaes, who is a Coolidge biographer and um, former journalist in New York, um, who came to Regent to speak about President Coolidge. And I already read her book, Coolidge. Um, her masterful biography of the president, and um, I got to talking to her, and she told me that the Coolidge Foundation had a job opening. So I applied, and I got the position, and I've been with the foundation for about a year and a half now in charge of programs. So um, it's been a wonderful experience. I love Vermont tremendously, and I love President Coolidge tremendously, and all the people that we get to work with um, at the Coolidge Foundation and the President Coolidge State Historic Site. It's been a tremendous experience, and I'm very grateful to be here uh, today to speak with you about President Coolidge. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about Calvin Coolidge. Who was he? Where did he come from? What's the Vermont connection? Oh, certainly. Well, um, President Coolidge was born on the 4th of July, 1872. He is the only president in American history to be, to be born on the 4th of July. Um, so that's a, a something that we, we are very grateful for <laughs> to fate. <laughs> um, and he was raised in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, which is in Windsor County, um, sort of between Killington and Woodstock, or near, near Ludlow. And um, he was raised by his, his father, John Coolidge, um, and his mother, Victoria Moore Coolidge. Um, in, in Plymouth Notch, his father was sort of a jack-of-all-trades. Um, he was the manager of the general store. He was the um, school superintendent, the collector of the snow tax the um, town constable, a state representative, a state senator. <laughs> so he's, he was, uh, he was in, in everything, basically. And um, his mother was um, sort of just a housewife, and she was very sickly um, when Calvin was growing up. And then she died very tragically when he was 12 years old. Um, so Victoria sort of recedes, although he valued his mother tremendously when he died in 1933. Um, her portrait was found in his pocket. So, um, yeah, Victoria died from tuberculosis when he was 12, so he was reared mostly by his father, John, and um, he attended Black River Academy in Ludlow, Vermont, which is no longer a school, but it's now a museum. I encourage everyone to visit in Ludlow um, for, for high school, and it was, a, it was a private high school. Back in those days, high school was not compulsory, um, and then after he graduated from high school, he uh, leaves Vermont, or attempts to leave Vermont to go to Amherst College in, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He fails to pass the, <laughs> the entrance exam at Amherst, so he spends a year um, sort of redoubling his efforts back in Plymouth with his father. He discovers that St. Johnsbury Academy in St. Johnsbury, Vermont has the sort of um, uh, reciprocal agreement with Amherst that allows any student who gets a certificate from St. Jay's to attend Amherst without passing the exam. So Calvin goes up to St. Jay's for a semester and then finally gets into Amherst. He spends four years at Amherst College studying classics and, and the like in philosophy and politics. Um, then he graduates in 1895 and goes into studying the law. He didn't go to law school. Uh, back in those days, it was, law, it was very common for lawyers to uh, read the law. Mm -hmm. So he, apprenticed, he apprentices at uh, the law firm of Hammond and Field in Northampton, Massachusetts, and becomes a lawyer. And then by about 1898, he launches his political career. And mind you, he's only, but 26 years old. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he starts very young. Um, he runs, he runs, well, first he gets on the Republican City Committee, and then he runs for city council in Northampton, the Northampton Common Council, 
he wins and then he's elected as um, city solicitor in Northampton, serves for a year or two, then he goes on to the um, county courts, he becomes the clerk of the county court in Hampshire County, Massachusetts. Um, then he runs for school board in Northampton and that's the only election he loses in 1904 because um, people tell him he has no children. But then he meets Grace Anna Goodhue Coolidge, or Goodhue, um, who eventually becomes Grace Coolidge, who is a teacher at the um, Clark School for the Deaf in, in Northampton and is a native of Burlington, Vermont, uh, born and raised on Maple Street in, in Burlington. Her house is now owned by Champlain College, where she mm. grew up. Um, and she's, she's an alum of the University of Vermont as well, but she's down in Northampton teaching at the Clark School. Calvin meets her, they fall in love, they get married in October of 1904. Um, Calvin loses that election, sadly, but um, he says, might give me time. Once I ha start having children, I'll never lose another election, and that was the case. <laughs> then he runs for um, the state legislature in Massachusetts. He's elected in 1906 to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Then he comes back to Northampton and becomes mayor of Northampton. Then in 1911, he's elected to the state senate becomes a state senator, serves for several, several years in the state senate, eventually becomes senate president, and he uh, passes a, a number of degree, uh, pieces of legislation to, for instance, um, increase teacher salaries and implement a 60-hour um, work week and sort of things that would be considered progressive mm -hmm. by today's standards, although sort of rudimentary things <laughs> I would think of these <laughs> days. Um, but then uh, he becomes Senate President in 1914, serves for two years in that position, and then uh, the Republican leadership in Vermont, or in Massachusetts, I'm sorry, says, this guy Coolidge seems like um, he'd, he'd do well advancing. So he runs for Lieutenant Governor in 1916 and wins that position and serves uh, for two years and then is elected Governor of Massachusetts in um, 1919. And um, in that first year as governor, he has one of the biggest challenges of his life, uh, his political life, which is the Boston police strike. Mm -hmm. um, when the police officers of Boston go on strike and there's pandemonium and mayhem in, in Boston because uh, public order is not being observed. And you have to put that also into the context of what's going on in the world at that time. That's right at the beginning of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's insurrection and revolutions all over the world. So people want public order and, and democracy to be defended. Um, so President Coolidge fires the police force and hires a whole new force. Um, and he sends a famous telegram to Samuel Gompers, the founder of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, saying there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And he receives the backing of President Wilson, a Democrat, uh, for maintaining order in, in Boston. And the publicity that this gives him launches him onto the national stage. He's no longer just a provincial Massachusetts politician. Um, so at the 1920 Republican National Convention in Chicago, the one where the proverbial smoke-filled room nominates Senator Warren Harding of Ohio after lots of wrangling with other, other candidates, um, the the convention goers nominate Governor Calvin Coolidge of Massachusetts by acclamation as the vice presidential candidate in 1920. And in that election, the first in which women are allowed to vote nationwide, um, the Harding-Coolidge ticket wins about 60% of the nationwide vote, a huge landslide, um, and they're ushered into, into the presidency and the vice presidency. Uh, so Coolidge is, is vice president from 21, 1921 to 1923 with Harding in the, in the driver's seat. Harding um, had a, a very warm relationship with President Coolidge. Um, Florence Harding, his wife, did not have, have as warm of a relationship with Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> she thought Grace was a little too um, ebullient and beautiful and taking the limelight away from, from her. Um, and then actually once, they, once Harding dies and they become first and President First Lady, she takes a little a little too long to move out of the White House. She wants to, you know, she wants to keep the limelight as long as possible. But I digress. 
Um, Calvin doesn't really enjoy being vice president. It's it, the Senate runs itself basically. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and but but President Harding is very gracious. He allows him to sit in on cabinet um, meetings and whatnot. First vice president in history to be able to do that. Um, but in the run-up to Harding's death in 23, it had been something like seven months since he had last seen the president. So th we come to that fateful, those fateful events in the summer of 1923, when um, President Harding is on a western swing. He's, he becomes the first president to visit Alaska in, in that summer. And when he's in San Francisco at the beginning of August 1923, he very suddenly dies on the 2nd of August. And um, so Calvin Coolidge, who was vice president at the time, who's actually in Vermont on that occasion. He's in Plymouth Notch um, vacationing, visiting his father, who still lives in Plymouth Notch in the homestead. So Coolidge becomes president when Harding dies immediately, but it takes time for word to get to Plymouth Notch. They send a telegram to White River Junction, and that's wired to Bridgewater, Vermont, and then a courier takes the message to Plymouth in the middle of the night midnight, um, President Coolidge's father answers the door, receives this message telling him that his son is now president, and he walks up the stairs with fear and trembling um, to tell his son that he's now the, the chief executive of the United States. And it's decided on that very night that President Coolidge would take the oath of office and his father would administer the oath. So Colonel John Coolidge, the father, administers the presidential oath of office um, to his son, President Calvin Coolidge, in the parlor of the family homestead in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, wow. 2.47 a.m. on August 2nd, 1923. The, that's probably the most unique presidential inauguration <laughs> to ever take place in American history, and it took place right here in Vermont. Um, so Calvin becomes president, takes over from Harding, and restores the um, dignity and luster of the presidency that had been tarnished by the the scandals of the Harding years with the Teapot Dome scandal and, and all of that, and receives the confidence of the American people to such a degree that in the 1924 election, he is elected president with 54% of the national vote. And um, this is against not just the Democratic candidate, John W. Davis, but also against a third party progressive candidate, um, Robert La Follette from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it's an overwhelming victory, and um, he's ushered in to the White House on, in his own right in March of 1925. And for the next four years, um, he would implement legislation in a number of areas relating to taxes. In particular, Coolidge is, is definitely the tax president. The um, top marginal rate under President Coolidge was 25%, the lowest that it's been since. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the country did very well under President Coolidge. The era was known as the Coolidge Prosperity. Um, we had very low unemployment, and um, people got access to things that made their lives better that we'd never seen before, like uh, telephones and cars and radios and all that sort of thing. The President, Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties, indeed. Um, and it's interesting that someone like President Coolidge, who was very temperamentally conservative, was the, the man who presided over that era that was very sort of revolutionary in many respects. Um, but the people have a lot of affection for President Coolidge and for his wife, Grace Coolidge, because um, he's a very sympathetic figure in many respects, because, um, for instance, his son, Calvin Jr., um, his younger son, dies in the White House in the summer of 1924, very tragically after um, a tennis match where he wasn't wearing socks, and so he got a blister, mm. and the blister went septic, and he was dead, sadly, within a week. So, um, unfortunately, something like that really endeared President Coolidge and Mrs. Coolidge to the American people because at that time it was not very uncommon for people to lose children um, who were in the prime of their lives in that way because we didn't have antibiotics and that sort of thing mm -hmm. very sadly. Um, but this is the era where America takes flight. Um, Coolidge gives the medal to Charles Lindbergh who um, makes that famous transatlantic flight into Paris in 1927. Um, it's, it's an era of moving pictures, and um, Coolidge, like I said earlier, is the radio president. Um, he's the first president to have his voice recorded on radio. His inauguration in 1925 was broadcast to the whole country on radio. Um, he makes 
ample use of the press. He gives more press conferences than any president before or since that I know of, uh, personal press conferences, um, which sort of belies the silent cow. Right, the, the silent cow <laughs> moniker, um, which, which is, is sort of a misnomer because um, while President Coolidge was definitely very terse in sort of personal conversation, mm -hmm. he was not a, the type of person who really enjoyed chit chat and small talk. Um, when it came to getting his message out to the American people and connecting with the American people, he had no problem um, utilizing the media of the day to do that. And um, even after he became president, or after he, I'm sorry, after he left the presidency in 1929, he became a newspaper columnist. He had a column that ran uh, called Calvin Coolidge Says from 1929 to 1930. So uh, he continued to, to get his uh, voice out to the American people. Did he run for re-election? He did not run for re-election in 1928. He, he's the one who said, I do not choose I to run. I do not run. choose okay. to run, yes. When he was well, out this is in coming South back Dakota. to you now. This, this Indeed. Is high school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, he was out in South Dakota on vacation with Mrs. Coolidge, and he didn't even tell her that he was not going to run. He just, sent a, he just gave a slip of paper to um, the, the press corps who was following him that said, I do not choose to run in 1928. Um, and the reason he gave in his autobiography is that he said that it's best to get out of out of Dodge when they still want you than to let the luster um, fall away. And it makes sense because um, we we didn't live in the era of Roosevelt prior to President Coolidge. He, had he um, run for re-election in 1928 and won, which it was you know very likely that he would have because he was still very popular, he would have been by the time he he left office in 1933 he would have been in, in the presidency for almost 10 years, which was unheard of up to that point. So he decided that six years was good enough. He served for a total of 67 months, and um, that it was time to give up the ghost and, and hand, it on, hand on power to uh, the next guy. And um, he was succeeded by his Commerce Secretary, Herbert Hoover. What did he do after the White House? Well, after the White House, he served on um, the board of um, New York Life Insurance. He, like I said, wrote that newspaper column, um, Calvin Coolidge Says, and um, was involved in all sorts of charitable sorts of things and, and um, very slightly helping out with Republican politics. He, he gave, um, the last public speech he gave was at the 1932 Republican National Convention um, in Hoover's favor. Mm -hmm. And we all know how that, that turned out. <laughs> but, um, and then President Coolidge died. He had a very brief post-presidency. He died on January 5th, 1933. So just not, not even four years after he left office, he, he passed away at the age of 60. Wow. Now Grace was a native of Burlington, Vermont. Uh, Indeed. Tell us a little bit about her. Yes. Well, Grace Coolidge was born on um, uh, July 8th, 19, or 1879 in, in um, Burlington, Vermont. And she was raised by Andrew Issachar Goodhue, her father, and Lamira Goodhue, her mother. She was an only child. and um, her house is 312 Maple Street. You can visit today. Uh, there's a historic marker outside of it, as I mentioned earlier, owned by Champlain College. And um, she attended the University of Vermont and studied teaching and graduated in 1901 and then moved down to uh, Northampton, Massachusetts to be a teacher of the deaf at the Clark School. And uh, then she met Calvin Coolidge and got married in 1904 and started having children she had, they had two sons. John Coolidge was born in 1906, and Calvin Coolidge Jr. was born in 1908. And all through those years, when Calvin is a politician in Boston, in the state house, and um, as you know, as governor and state senator and that sort of thing, um, Grace is back in Northampton raising the boys. Mm -hmm. So back in those days, there wasn't a. Well, actually, I don't think there's still even to this day there's a governor's mansion in Massachusetts. But um, definitely back then, Grace would not have been involved with any of the politics at all. Um, and it, was, it wasn't until Calvin became vice president and they had to move to D.C. that she really became a part of the social scene of, of politics. And um, once she got on that stage, she was one of the most well-loved first ladies in American history. Because of her, her contrast, really, with Calvin's personality, uh, he was, like I said, very sort of terse and, and grave, mm -hmm. and not, not a very warm, fuzzy kind of guy. Grace was the complete opposite. She was buoyant and loving and um, emotive and, and, and just a, a, a light to, to the nation for, through those many years. And um, she loved being First Lady. She was a fashion trendsetter. 
Um, and it was great this past season at the historic site. The um, historic site displayed a number of her couture gowns that she wore while she was first lady and, and other effects, her jewelry and purses and hats and that sort of thing. Um, you could really see how she helped um, set fashion trends in, in the 1920s, uh, in that era of revolutionary fashions. <laughs> and um, after Calvin died in 1933, she was able to, in some respects, blossom herself. Um, she made a tour of Europe in the mid-1930s. She moved into a great new house in Northampton. She, she really presided over Northampton society for the mm -hmm. next 30 years, uh, or 25 years or so. She died in 1957. Wow. Well, this is really fascinating. I, I, I really am very impressed by your knowledge and your enthusiasm. And it really makes this... Uh, bring these people alive, particularly the Vermont connection. Certainly. And this, and I'm getting a little bit of a taste for what the foundation is like. And tell us about this, this foundation Certainly. and the site. And there's a number of programs uh, uh, involved in it, but tell us about the, the foundation itself Certainly. that keeps this, uh, that we're talking about here. Well, um, people are often confused about the, the what, what exactly, who owns what and who does what mm -hmm. at the historic site, because um, the President Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site is owned by the state of Vermont, mm -hmm. the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. And they do a tremendous job of preserving the, um, the buildings and doing the interpreting of the history of um, Calvin and Grace Coolidge and the, the life in Plymouth Notch in the 1920s. And um, if you visit Plymouth Notch today, they are the ones who will um, lead you around and show you all the sites and they maintain all the historic effects there in the village. Um, the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation was founded in 1960 by John Coolidge, their um, elder son, to serve essentially as a support for the state of Vermont in its efforts to preserve the legacy of Calvin and Grace Coolidge. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do that through an, a variety of ways. Um, our main mission, as I said, is to promote the the life and values and knowledge of President Calvin Coolidge and his wife, Grace Coolidge. And um, we have a, a number of programs, including our signature program, our main program is our debate program. We bring high school students from all over the country to Plymouth Notch to learn about President Coolidge every summer and to, to debate, debate important public policy issues facing our country today um, from you know a, a ton of different perspectives. Um, the, the kids who come to the Notch are all over the place politically and, and as far as their knowledge of President Coolidge. But it's great that um, we can use the historic site as a tool to teach young people about economics and about politics and history. And it's amazing the, the, the things in the village and the ways you can connect President Coolidge's life and his father's life to issues um, today. For instance, back in the, in the 2013 season, we had debaters at the Notch debating the issue of protectionism, mm -hmm. whether or not you put um, tariffs on imported goods or sort of a, a, a duty mm -hmm. before um, foreign goods can be sold in the United States. And you connect that to the general store, for instance, that, that is in Plymouth Notch, where President Coolidge's father was the manager for so many years. Um, being able to sell his goods um, abroad, maybe, having, having a duty imposed on those goods would make it more difficult for him to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one example of a way that we use the historic site to teach young people about about um, economic concepts, for instance, because Calvin Coolidge was an economic president um, above all. And uh, the foundation also has a tremendous website that um, you can visit, coolidgefoundation.org. Uh, it has all sorts of information about President Coolidge, his life, his speeches, Etc. as well as um, our initiatives, our blog. You, there's lots of historical information on the blog. Um, and our programs, like, for instance, our um, Coolidge Prize for Journalism and our Calvin Prize for Vermont Youth, which we just issued um, a few weeks ago. The Coolidge Prize for Journalism is a $20,000 prize for um, a journalist of any medium, whether it be traditional print media or blogs or the Internet, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, who writes in the spirit and style of President Coolidge, um, and particularly be brief in his 1915 acceptance speech as president of the S Massachusetts Senate. Um, the speech said, be brief, above all things, be brief. <laughs> so 
Um, we encourage writers to be brief and, and direct and to the point like President Coolidge was. And the winner of the prize um, this year was a gentleman named Stephen Frias um, from Rhode Island who writes letters to the editor columns basically to Rhode Island newspapers. Um, and we think it's a great way to elevate people who um, may not be well known by, mm. by the journalistic community but still um, embody those values and, and the style of President Coolidge. Um, so that's a, a prize we're very, very enthusiastic about and we think it's, it's really done a lot to elevate um, voices that reflect President Coolidge. And then we also have our Calvin Prize for Vermont Youth, which was issued to a gentleman named Ethan Forster, who is a student at St. Johnsbury Academy, President Coolidge's alma mater, mm -hmm. um, which is a thousand dollar prize um, for a young person who writes um, in response to our annual prompt. And this year's prompt was about whether or not higher education was worth the value to young people and their families, given the you know, exploding cost of college education these days and the debt that oftentimes students have to take on to um, get a college education. And Ethan wrote a, an excellent essay and, and won, the, won the award. That's and, great. Um, so we've been giving out those two prizes for the last three years and we hope to continue that in the future. And um, our biggest new initiative that we have coming up is our Coolidge Scholarship, which will be a full ride scholarship um, tuition, room, board, and books for um, a student who applies at CoolidgeScholars.org. <laughs> um, and, and you apply in your junior year for that so that you have the funding in place. You know that you have the funding in place when you start applying to college in your senior year. Um, and we want to make this into sort of a, uh, a Rhodes Scholarship um, mm. in President Coolidge's name for undergraduates in the United States. And they can take the scholarship to any university in the United States that they choose. Wow. So um, we're very grateful for our, um, the support that, that scholarship has gotten. And uh, we hope that students will apply starting tomorrow. The application opens on November 2nd and it's open through March of uh, 2016. So in your junior year, you can apply for that one. So. And what, 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 what does a student have to do? Is, is he, is he well, we, we pride ac academic excellence. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely we want the cream of the crop students to apply um, and also you have to write an essay that uh, reflects on Coolidge's values and so the main the main goal of the scholarship is to get young people thinking about President Coolidge's history um, and the the history of our, our country that he ties into so um, importantly and hopefully this will help elevate knowledge of, of President Coolidge because um, you have all these very bright young people writing about him in applying for this very competitive and very prestigious scholarship. And, and that's for four years for any, any school four of choice? Four years to any school of your choice. Wow. Complete, full ride, everything. And it's not need-based need, ba need based either. So any student who um, exhibits the qualities that we are looking for and is a superior student can receive the scholarship. That's amazing. And uh, tell us a little bit about the, the site itself. What, what, sure. what is there? Absolutely. Well, hopefully well, we're going to put some photos of that in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the historic site is um, about 500 acres of um, beautiful Vermont countryside nestled in sort of a bowl of mountains. Um, the, what I call the heart and soul of the village is the homestead, which is where Coolidge lived um, from the age of four until he went to Black River Academy when he was um, in high school. And it is also, I call it the heart of the village because that's the place where President Coolidge was sworn in as president mm -hmm. on um, August 3rd, 1923. So you can go, when you visit the historic site, you have to go to the parlor of the homestead and everything there is original. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I think that is the most unique about the President Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site. Everything in the buildings um, and the buildings themselves are exactly as they were in 1923. Um, so when you go into the Oath of Office rooms as, as it's referred to today, you will see the, um, the kerosene lamp that lit the scene, the Bible that was on the table when he took the oath, the, the pen that he used to sign the documents, the, it's all there, um, as well as the bedroom he was sleeping in when his father came and knocked on the door and told him he was president. Um, and, and that's in the homestead. And lots of, uh, lots of other things like a, a, a carriage that his father built, for instance. Uh, the handcuffs that he used as 
the town constable any time he had to arrest somebody. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. Um, but then also we have uh, the birthplace of Calvin Coolidge is there as well. So you can go into the birthplace, which is right behind the general store where his father worked um, and managed for many years. Um, you can go into the general store. It's run now by the state of Vermont as a gift shop. Um, the Summer White House, as we refer to it, which is right above the general store where President Coolidge worked in the summer of 24 when he came to Vermont um, on vacation in that summer. The work of the presidency does not cease just because mm -hmm. the president's on vacation. So he, he um, commandeered the um, dance hall for the village as his office for that summer, basically. Um, we also have the Plymouth Cheese Factory, which was founded by his father and some other farmers in the village in 1890 and is still operational today. And it has the best cheese in the state of Vermont, is <laughs> if I do say so myself. So <laughs> please, please um, visit Plymouth Artisan Cheese or order some cheese online. It's, it's delicious cheese. That's great. Yes, indeed. Um, and also, of course, there's the Plymouth Notch Cemetery, which is where six or seven generations of Coolidge's are buried, including Calvin and Grace. So um, you can visit their, their grave sites in, in the, the village cemetery. And it's a very humble, humble um, presidential resting place. I was recently in upstate New York and I visited Chester Allen Arthur's grave, who is another Vermont president, mm -hmm. at least born in Vermont, uh, although he spent most of his life in New York. And he's buried in Albany. And he has this very sort of elaborate grave that's a, um, it looks almost like an altar, if you will. Um, but at Plymouth Notch, the only thing that's on President Coolidge's grave that would even tell you that he was president is the presidential seal. Wow. It just says Calvin Coolidge, July 4th, 1872 to January 5th, 1933. That's it. It's a very humble, humble grave site. Um, and there's also the Wilder House where his mother grew up. Um, it's now a restaurant that's run by um, the state of Vermont. And the um, barn across the way has one of the most complete collections of 19th century Vermont farm implements that I think I've ever seen. Um, so it's a, it's a real step back into time, uh, the way the, the village is preserved. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I almost forgot. The one, the one historic um, thing in the village that the, Cal the Coolidge Foundation owns, is, which is the church, the Union Christian Church, which is where the Coolidge family uh, worshipped. And, and that, that building is actually now owned by the Coolidge Foundation, not by the state of Vermont. Um, separation of church and state issues, of course. <laughs> but we all, we, you know, it's open to the public as well to, to visit. And is it a church still? It's uh, not. There's no congregation there uh, currently. But um, you can go in and visit. We do have special um, events in there. And there's a flag that marks the pew where the Coolidge family sat. And actually, this past 4th of July, um, 4th of July is always a big celebration at Plymouth Notch. Um, the, the current president, whoever he is, always sends a wreath that's mm. laid on President Coolidge's grave by um, the adjutant general of the state of Vermont, wow. currently um, Mr. Cray, um, who is, they, they're wonderful, and they always come down every year. It, um, it makes a very, a very special Fourth of July celebration. Um, but um, on Fourth of July this past year, um, Jim Cook, who is the Calvin Coolidge impersonator for the last 30 years, gave his final performance in the Union Christian Church, mm -hmm. which is where he gave his first performance um, back in n 1985. So it was a very, and, and that performance is actually in the presence of John Coolidge, his, uh, President Coolidge's son, um, and his wife Florence. And, and this performance last summer was in the presence of President Coolidge's great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. So and that's called More Than Two Words? More Than Two Words. The life I, of I know there's a, a tape that uh, I've seen of it, the yes. eight track, and it might be still in some libraries. Oh, so sure. I yes, saw indeed. one of them in a, in a library here. You can find it on YouTube as well. Really? Because um, Jim has taken this act all over the country. And he's a Vermont native. He was born in Montpelier, but now he lives down in Quincy, Massachusetts. But, yeah, this is... Uh, um, more than two words with Jim Cook as uh, Calvin Coolidge. I yes, indeed. So yes, I don't it's know a, if you have that, but it's I a great, it. it's a great, um, a great presentation, and it's actually Jim. Jim is a, a fabulous guy. He, if you want to get good Coolidge history, Jim Cook is the person to ask. <laughs> Outside <laughs> of you, because you're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an amateur compared to Jim, <laughs> but um, Jim has memorized huge sections of the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge, and and that's a, a large part of this performance, which it's it's just. Fabulous, an absolutely fabulous performance. That's great. 
Now, uh, if anyone wants, we're going to pre present the, uh, the website, and uh, uh, we, we have uh, uh, ways that people can get in touch with you, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also that uh, uh, what, what events are coming up now? It's, it's the beginning of November. Uh, what's going to happen? We talked about the essay contest and, mm -hmm. and the debate, and we'll just roll around. Anything special during the holidays? Sure. Well, uh, there is the, the holiday open house on December 5th, mm -hmm. uh, Saturday, December 5th, that um, you're welcome to come to. Usually there's snow on the ground in Plymouth by that point, which makes it very lovely. Um, Farmer Fred, one of the locals, Fred um, DePaul, will take you on a sleigh ride through, through, the, through the hills there. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic experience. I encourage all of you to come for the holiday open house. Um, but the historic site is closed in the winter, like all Vermont mm -hmm. state historic sites. Um, but we do have a museum that can be opened um, in the winter if you would like to come visit the museum. And particularly, we encourage school groups to come. Um, we can do programs for you to, to educate your students about President Coolidge um, and the village and whatnot during the winter. Anytime, just please give us a call, 802-672-3389, or visit CoolidgeFoundation.org. Um, we'd be happy to have as many school groups as, as want to come to the Notch in the winter to come. Um, and then the site opens again in May, um, usually Memorial Day weekend for, for the general public. That's great. Um, yes, but there's, it, we, are, we are a 24, um, or not 24 hours, <laughs> 9 to 5, uh, but, but uh, definitely 365 days of the year. We're open um, Monday through Friday every, every day of the year, even when the site is closed. Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, I want to thank uh, you for uh, coming here, and uh, uh, we can. Uh, there's a website, and people can look. And there's a telephone number we'll we'll make available on the website, and if you want to get more information about the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, and I want to thank Rashad Thomas uh, from the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation for visiting us here on Positively Vermont, and thank you for watching. Thank you.